I got a question for you today. And this is a this is a straight up pastor to parishioner church person question. Do you know that I'm rooting for you? Now listen to me. As your pastor, my number one job is to be sick him to a bulldog for you, to encourage you, to light the fire under you, to, to encourage you, to push you, to prod sometimes even, to help you be the best version of you that God created you to be. Folks, I believe in you. Not because of all the good you've done or not like you because of all the bad you've done. I believe in you because of what God can do through you. Because I've seen it so many times. I remember a young man that was in our youth group in Dayton, Tennessee. And he worked at KFC. Have you ever been around somebody that works with chicken all day? They smell like chicken all night. I don't care what they do. This kid smelled like a grease pit all the time. And he was from a very poor home. He basically was living on his own at 17, working all the time. But he came to church, and I'll never forget, on a Wednesday night, he looked at me, and he says, I want this Jesus you're talking about. And I prayed over him. He said the prayer. God radically transformed his life. The next week, he showed up, and he took our old jalopy church van. That I'm not kidding. It might seat 10 people because the way they'd taken the chairs out and they had like bus things on the side. And one day when I was driving it, I dropped a 96 year old man out the back door because he leaned up against it and it fell wide open. True story, he didn't die. He's good. Well, he's not now, he's in heaven, but that was a long time ago. I dropped him right on the highway. True story. Well, this kid, he goes, How many kids you want tonight? I said, I need 42 kids in youth group tonight. Well, he thought I meant in one load. I said this van seats 10. And he went out, Scott went out, and he went to the projects where we'd pick up these kids because Dayton's one of the poorest counties or towns in America at that time. 70% of the kids were on welfare. And we're out there picking them up, telling them about Jesus, giving them hope. Scott goes out and brings in 30-something kids in one load. There's smoke billowing out from around the, the, the tires where they're rubbing on the frame. And, and, and he said, yeah, he said, we lost two down there on the corner. The side door fell off. I said, what'd you do? He said, well, after they got done sledding through the field, we picked them up and brought them on down and jammed that door back up there. I said, Scott, you didn't have to get them all at once. He goes, oh, I ain't done. I got 10 more. I'm bringing, I told you, I'm going to get 42. He brought 42 kids to church. He'd been saved one week. He knew Jesus one week. And the next week, he drove dangerously 42 kids to youth group. This is a true story. Several years ago through Facebook, he found me. And he called me. And he said, Pastor Randy, you don't remember me, but I'm Scott from KFC. And immediately I smelled chicken. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I said, Scott, I can never forget you, man. He said, well, I just want to give you an update. I'm still living for Jesus. I'm a board member of my Baptist church down here in Tennessee, and, and I'm also the youth leader. I just thought you'd want to know. Randy, why are you telling us that? There's potential in every person in this room. If you say, yes, God... There is no limit to what you can do. Now, I don't need you to bring 42 people in a 10-passenger van next week. But you can make multiple trips. You can bring all you want. I don't care. Why are you telling us this? Because I think sometimes we come to church and, and we kind of go through the motion of church, but we forget that we're not just trying to, you know, whether it's Pastor Mark or me or any speaker, we're not just trying to, to, to coddle you and, and just pat you on the back. Well, folks, we're trying to tell you God's got a plan for your life. Well, Pastor Randy, I've made so many mistakes. How can God use me? I don't know how to use David. Not only have an affair, get a woman pregnant, he had her husband killed to hide it. 
And God still made him king. I don't understand how God can use us after we've done things. All I know is he created us for greatness. And it's time we start believing what the word says or why are we here? So if you want to sit there and be doubting Thomas, I'm not going to let you. If you want to sit there and go, woe is me, I can't really do much because of X, Y, Z, then folks, I'm not going to quit. Because I'm stubborn like that. That's my wife. Why? Because Brandy, if people had gave up on me, where would I be? They said, get back up on that horse and keep riding. Don't you quit. Where would I be? Lost. Why? Because I was created to do what God's called me to do. And if I don't do that, I got nothing. Folks, some of you are missing out on this thing. God has for you because you're sitting there doubting and woe is me and look at all the crap, look at the past, look at the joy. Hey, in one week, 42 kids in a 10 pastor day. You know what the sad part of that story was? We had a guy in our church, his name was Red. I'll call him out because he's probably dead too. And I'm not sure he went to heaven. Red had a, one of them really nice conversion vans. So when Steve, our pastor, Pastor Steve, Bishop Steve, when he saw how many kids we had, he said, hey, we got to get some rides to get these kids home. He said, they can't go back in that van. I said, I don't think the van's running. I, th- I think we broke the rear axle in that van. And we did. True story. We had too many kids. And... So he said, we got to get the people from the church to help out. So he went to Red. He said, Red, you got that van. Would you take some of the kids home? He goes, no way. I'm not putting them nasty kids in my van. <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm putting them nasty kids in my van. And he drove home. You know who helped us? Two little old ladies. With, one had a Toyota Corolla and one had a, like a Nissan Sentra. They could haul five at a time max. And they just kept making trips, taking them kids home. I had some in my truck. I didn't have much. I didn't have more. I put five or six in the back. But, And I thought about that. Folks, listen. It's up to us if we're going to do something for God or not. But today I want to talk to you about a subject where it all starts. You have a handout in your hand. Now what you do with it's up to you. I don't care. I do care. I care a lot. But I can't make you do anything with it. But if you can't talk to God, you probably can't do great things for God. Is that a given? Huh. I, just this morning, it, you know, I think God has a great sense of humor. He started dealing with me early in the week that I was going to be speaking on this topic. And this morning in my devotions, I read where they went into the Holy of Holies without the anointing, and they died. I don't know about you, but that makes coming before God like a whole different thing. Because I'm pretty sure I'm not holy. And I don't measure up to that Old Testament standard. Like if I went in the Holy of Holies, that's why they put bells on the tassels. So if the bell quit ringing, they knew you were dead and they'd drag you out. They had a rope tied to you. It's a true story. Read it. It's in a book. And so here's these guys they took unholy. They went in unworthily and he killed them. It really makes you want to go, I got Can we talk? (laughs) Lightning dead. And I think some people, that's how we view God. But see, what we forget is Jesus came and he tore the veil of the temple. And he opened it wide. And because he died and was perfect, even though we're imperfect, we can talk to a perfect God. That's pretty cool. But we get stuck in, if I talk to God, he's going to strike me dead. You know some of the best prayers I've ever prayed? Hey, God, it's me again. I really screwed up. And you know what I found? Not one time, John Cook, has he ever been hammer God. The only time he's ever been hammer God to me is when I didn't come to him and say, hey, God, I'm an idiot. But when I go to God and say, hey, God, I've messed up, you know what God does every time? Every time. He don't make you wallow in it. 
He don't sit there and make you feel horrible. Our sin, when we confess it, the conviction goes away. Did you hear that? So that guilt, that conviction you feel when you sin, when you say, Jesus, I'm sorry, I messed up. You know what happens? It's gone. I've told you this before. The problem with it is, when we sin, conviction shows up. But Satan sends another C word, the letter C. It's called condemnation. And God puts conviction on us so it'll make us feel bad. And then we'll come to him and say, God, I'm sorry. And when we say, I'm sorry, it goes away. But Satan puts a word on us called condemnation. And I don't care how much you pray, it won't go away. It'll beat you. It'll stomp on you. It'll kick you while you're down. It'll smack you in the teeth and make you feel like a horrible person. But it's not from God. Everybody say, it's not from God. The enemy of your soul wants to steal, kill, and destroy you. And if he can't steal, kill, and destroy you, he at least wants to keep you from being effective. And it's working on most of us. You are not your best version of you because you're wallowing in some condemnation. And I'm telling you, if you ask God to forgive you, he forgave you. I don't care how you feel. If you said, God, I'm sorry, boom, gone. The Bible says as far as the east is from the west, play through it into the sea of forgetfulness. I used to be a sticker or something, a little saying that went around and said, if you want to mess with my past, you got to go through the blood of Jesus to get it. People will mess with your past, won't they? <laughs> Especially... The people that know how we're supposed to do life, they don't even try. It's amazing to me. Listen, I started this with, I'm rooting for you. I'm trying to help you get to become the best version of you. Why? Because there's 42 kids need somebody to bring them to church. And a lot more. See, the thing is, every one of us, Scott was created for that moment. Scott was created to do something great that built my confidence like nothing I'd ever seen in my life. Man, when you grow 42 in a week in a youth group, that's pretty cool. I wish I said 102. <laughs> I want to see how that story would end it. Listen. I can't look at every one of you and say, here's what God says. I'm not that guy. I can't, I can't tell you the exact plan, Roger, and how God's going to use your gifts, talents, and abilities to bless others for him. But I know this. God wants to use Roger and your gifts, talents, and abilities to bless others. And some of you are doing it every day, and you don't give God credit because you don't understand. That's just who you are. Well, duh. That's who he created you to be. I'm a little outgoing. I get that. I wasn't always like that. I used to be pretty shy. I was sitting in a rooster's yesterday, eating some wings. My favorite food. <laughs> and cheeseburgers are right there, boy, I'm telling you. And I'm eating some wings, and, and there's just four black folks right next table from me. And there's one older guy and a, an older lady and two ladies, probably my age, so they were all old. <laughs> and I got done. I went and washed my hands, and something just said, just, just talk to them. So I picked on him. I said, dude. How'd you get so lucky to get lunch with three beautiful women? I'm over sitting by myself. He said, I'll share. <laughs> and I thought, whoa, wait a minute. I wasn't glad I had mine. He said, pull up a chair. So I stood there and talked. We talked 20 minutes. Listen to me. It don't take much to be kind. God created me that way to spark a conversation, and it led to well, what do you do? Well, I drive a bus. <laughs> Rowing you, that's what I was doing. I said, I'm a pastor. And she said, you know, I could tell you had Jesus in you. Said, wow. Wish my wife could see that. <laughs> could I give you a number to call and tell her you saw Jesus in me? But see, folks, that's some of what we don't understand. Some of just my outgoing person. It's what God does with Randy Davis to minister to people. God's using you as you do all kinds of things. Leading people at work. Managing people. 
helping with your family is Jesus with skin on. We make this so hard. We make it impossible. Like, like only holy people can really talk to God. And let's be honest. Is there anybody in here that really thinks you have a great prayer life? And if you do, that's great. But you're one in a million. Most people are intimidated to prayer. Because we don't feel worthy. Why would God listen to me? Who am I? A person he created. When I read this scripture, James 5, 16, it says, The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And I usually go, <laughs> I want to know who that guy is. I want him praying for me. That's honest. I don't feel like a righteous guy. I feel like a hillbilly. A normal guy. But the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. But I'm going to tell you, folks, I prayed some pretty fervent prayers on occasion. And every time I read in the scripture where the disciples said, Jesus, teach us to pray, I'm cautious with that prayer. Because you know what usually happens when you say, God, teach me to pray? He gives you something to pray about. <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice if we just started learning how to pray without getting desperate? So, on this paper are some things that I'm calling the locks and the keys of effective prayer. I was reminded of that bridge in Paris. I can't say the name of it, you know, but they, have, they had all the locks on the side, you know, and you'd put your name of you, I love so-and-so, and they'd lock it on and throw their key into the river Seine, and, and everybody's like, oh, that's cool. And, and it got so heavy, it broke the bridge. <laughs> love was killing people. Listen, when you think of a lock, it locks something in. But in this case, it's locking something out. So think about this. Something that locks you from having your prayers answered or blocks you from having your prayers answered. Praying without knowing Jesus. Listen, every one of us reached out to Jesus the first time before we were a follower of Christ. I'm not talking about that. But I, I see religious people sometimes, and, 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 and you know by their lifestyle, they probably ain't living for Jesus too much. <coughs> not that I'm judging, not that I'm trying to fruit inspect, but just how they conduct their written. And, and, and they'll say, I'll pray for you. And I'm thinking, that's going to be a vain prayer. I'm not being mean. I'm just telling you. A lot of people say, oh, I'll pray for you. They don't. They lie. Even in church. <laughs> we do it all the time. I'll be praying for you. Did you? You need to know Jesus. And if you have a relationship with him, I'm telling you, he's listening. He's listening when you ain't praying. He's listening when you're thinking. Satan can't do that. That's pretty cool. Jesus knows your thoughts before you ever make them vocal. And he's watching you all the time. He knows what you're going through, and he cares. If I'm rooting for you, how much more is God rooting for you? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Once you know Jesus, you get to talk to God, even when you've messed up. That's pretty cool. The second thing that blocks, praying from an unrepentant heart. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God has surely listened and heard my voice in prayer. Once you say, God, I'm sorry. That's why I usually start every prayer time with God. I'm sorry that I was a jerk to so-and-so today. And try to remember all the things where I messed up and confess my sins. And once my sins are confessed, now I'm going to start saying, hey, God. And while we're at it, so-and-so asked me to pray for them. God, would you minister to their need? And God, would you help so-and-so? And God, would you give me wisdom in this? And God, and then I can talk to God because I've, I've, I've asked for forgiveness. Because no matter how many times I ask for forgiveness, I used to do something I need some more forgiveness. Now, some of you got this down. You don't have to pray for forgiveness anymore. I ain't that guy. And you ain't either, by the way. You're lying to yourself. We need to confess our sins all the time. Preferably before we do it, so we won't do it. But that takes time. Praying for a show. 
Matthew 6, 5. When you pray, you're not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray and stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. If you pray to be heard by men, you better hope they can answer your prayer. Like the little boy during Christmas time said, Dear God, I pray Grandma, and he prayed it real loud because Grandma was next in the next room, that Grandma will get me a bike for Christmas. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> he prayed to be heard by Grandma. <laughs> Come on. But that's vain. And some people sound real spiritual. <laughs> But they're not. Praying repetitive, empty words. When you pray, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. Pages are sticking together. So do not be like them, for their father knows what you need, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Listen to me. That's one of my biggest pet peeves. I'm, I'm telling you, I don't judge people. But when you start praying out loud and say the same thing a whole lot in that prayer, I call it prayer by words. You might as well call it prayer cuss words. Just repeat. Oh, Lord God, show up today in Jesus' name. And oh, God, do what you need to do in Jesus' name. Oh, God, hell, in Jesus' name. Hell, hell. It's like, shut up. Who are you talking to? Thank God he hears that. According to that scripture, that's vain. That's somebody trying to look good, trying to be spiritual. Watch well, just how I pray. Shut up. Talk to God. You talk to me like that in Randy's name. Ah, come on. Really? My guess, no, folks, I'm talking about in prayer. I'm talking about preaching. That's different. People got their own way to preach. I don't care. But when you're talking to God, you don't need to tell him in Jesus' name 34 times in a two-sentence prayer. You don't need to repeat words and praise the Lord and hallelujah and, 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 and. Shut up. Talk to God. We don't talk to each other like that. Now, on occasion, I might repeat myself with my wife. She repeats herself a lot. <laughs> Did you get so-and-so done? Did you get <laughs> Yes, dear. Yes, dear. That's a rep repeat, right? Guys, listen to me. God wants you to talk to him, not about him. I love when people pray, and may the Lord God bless us today. Who are you talking to, us or God? God, would you bless us today is a more appropriate prayer. Can anybody make a difference to you? It's my pet peeve. Since I was a kid, I'd listen to people praying. I would literally sit there seven, eight, nine years old and go, who are they talking to? They're talking about God, but they ain't talking to God. That's good preaching. And I'm trying to help you. Why? Because I want you to be the best version of you. And when you talk to God effectively, God's going to do great things through your life. And when God does great things through your life, we're all going to be blessed by it. So get busy. Next thing is prayer is not prayed. James 4, 2. You do not have because you do not ask. That goes back to some of you being chicken. You're afraid if you talk to God, psh, pillar of salt. Listen to me. Don't be afraid to talk to God about anything. You never bother God except when you don't include him. Talk to God. Now, don't talk to God after the fact. Like the little boy who prayed, God, please make Dayton the, the capital of Ohio because he'd already took the test and that's what he put. Too late. That prayer is worthless. But if you prayed before, God help me remember that Columbus is the capital of Ohio. He'll help you with that. What does he say? I'll bring back to remembrance everything that you put in. Now, you can't not study and expect to make an A. But if you put it in, God will bring it back. I'll, that's how I got through Bible college. I'm a firm believer in that scripture. Students, you should be saying amen. Number six, praying with a lustful heart. 
You ask and you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasure. Some of you praying to win the lottery. You're going to give the church a little bit and the rest of it is going to ruin your life. Boy, it got quiet. Listen, if you do, you better tithe. But if you never play it, just tithe on what you already got and God will bless it. And he'll make it more than enough to meet the need. Praying while mistreating your spouse. First Peter 3, 7, you husbands in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. That means if we're mean to our wife, God ain't listening to us. We disrespect our wives, God ain't listening. Wow, I didn't know that. Now we do. Praying while ignoring the poor. Proverbs 21, 13. He who shuts his ear to the cry of the poor will also cry himself and not be answered. Praying with bitterness in your heart towards someone. Mark 11, 25, 26. Whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone. So your Father who is in heaven also will forgive you of your transgressions. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your transgressions. If you're praying one day and you remember, golly, I can't stand that person. Well, that's never happened to me. Boy, it's happened to me a lot. Because I'm trying to talk to God, and he's trying to remind me, I can't listen to you. Look at you. You got odd against that person. I can't answer your prayer. You better go fix it. Uh, Marisa! <laughs> Bright Dad! <laughs> Boss! Whoever. Right? If you're serious about your prayer, God will bring her to remembrance when you start to pray. Things you need to work on. It's part of prayer. That's why some of us don't pray. I don't need to be reminded. Just asking. So, praying with a faithless heart. James 1, 6 or 8. But if he must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. Being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Got to pray with faith. <coughs> that key's to unlock it. You see them praying by asking, seeking, and knocking. Praying in faith. Praying in secret. Now listen. There's a time and a place for corporate prayer where we gather together and we pray together as a church family. But I'm talking about when you're really talking to God. You need to have a place. Where you kind of shut yourself off. And if you're a mom, I don't know where that place is for you if you have young kids. I had one mom tell me that all she wanted for Mother's Day was to go and use the restroom and not have one kid in there with her at that time. I'll never forget that as long as I live. I thought that was a funny thing. And I thought, that's Marisa. Yeah, she probably feels the same way. Listen, find a place in secret. Praying according to God's will. God, I'm trying to do my finances your way. And God, we're coming up a little short on some bills here that we really got to pay. That's not vain. That's saying, God, help me meet my needs. I'm trying to do this thing your way. I need some help here. Folks, I can't tell you how many times God showed up at the end of my short month and helped come through. I got so many stories. I don't know which one to tell you. How God's proven himself faithful to Randy and Marisa Davis and our family over the years where he would just provide in ways. I remember one month when I first started selling cars and I wasn't doing very good. And I know I was going to pay my mortgage that month. You know, a youth pastor, a friend of mine from North Carolina who was selling real estate at the time, he, said, he called and he says, you, God laid you on my heart and I was supposed to pay your mortgage this month. Really? Yeah, really. And then he did it two months. Listen to me, I can't explain how God does what God does. But if you try to do it on your own and you try to figure it out, then God ain't going to be doing it. That don't mean you don't go to work and expect God to pay all your bills. But sometimes you work, 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 and it still ain't enough. God can still provide. 
I know it. I've, I've lived it. Praying in Jesus' name. Don't exclude Jesus in your prayers. Praying agreement with other believers where two, are gathered, two or three are gathered in my name. Now, don't make your prayer session a gossip session. We need to pray for so-and-so. She's been cheating on her husband. That's not a prayer meeting. That's a gossip session. Come on. That's good preaching. Praying while fasting. Having prayed with fasting, they commended to the Lord and who they had believed. Praying with an obedient life. Do the best you can to live for Jesus and watch him bless your life when you're obedient. Praying while abiding in Christ and the word. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you will and it will be done for you. That's a pretty big prayer. Praying while delighting in the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Remember the first time I Spoke to a college football team. It was at Youngstown State University. And I'll never forget one of the defensive linemen. He was sitting down in a chair, and I was almost looking him eye to eye. <laughs> he was a big boy. Luke, I think you understand this, but I stood there. I, I thought, God, all my life I dreamed of being a college football player. And I walked away from it. It's my choice. But I never had the opportunity. And now I get to stand in front of this great football team and tell them about you. Talk about a desire of your heart. It wasn't like I prayed God opened the door for me to speak to Youngstown State University. I just said, God, wherever you lead me, I'll go. Now for 20 years, I got to speak it on you every Saturday, every fall. 20 years. One of my guys said, right back there. A couple of them. Brian, you went there too. Listen. I don't know why God does some of the things he does for us, but listen, I know God wants to make a Scott out of every one of you and you don't even have to smell like chicken. That's all you're going to remember. Some of you are going to go to Lee's just in honor of Scott today. I know it. I just feel it. What's the end of that paper say? A summary. The locks and keys of prayer. You must be in right relationship right relationship with God. You must be in a right relationship with others. Huh, sound like that love thing we've been talking about the last couple weeks. And your heart must be right. And here's what I know about your heart, John Cook. I'm clueless. Dylan, here's what I know about your heart. I am clueless. I'm clueless. I'm clueless. Why? Because I'm on the outside. You are the only person that knows what's going on inside. Because some of you are great actors. How many know the greatest Oscar award winners sit in church every Sunday? Mm. How you doing? Oh, I'm fine. You liar. Now, everybody can see you ain't fine, but you're lying. You're saying everything's okay. Now, I'm okay with that. I don't mean you to. And there's others. They just puke on you every time you ask them how they're doing. So you quit asking them how they're doing. Good morning. <laughs> Some of you remembering back, what did he say to me this morning? He just said good morning. He didn't ask how I was. You're right. <laughs> Let's go back to our heart. Can anybody tell what's going on in your heart, Pat? Sometimes your heart's hurting so bad, but you can't tell anybody. Why? Because he's a dad and grandpa, and dads and grandpas don't do that sometimes. We gotta, he knows like I know. Nobody else can really help us but God. Dude, my heart's in turmoil. I got one go-to person. And sometimes I have to go to a couple of trusted confidants. But it starts. Hey, God, I'm hurting here. I need some help. When you get that honest with God, there's no telling what God can do. With you. Don't go to church. Be the church. Don't come and worship. Worship everywhere you're at. Don't just come into the temple. Be the temple. It's in the book. 
That's why he died. Not just so we could feel forgiven. Not just so we could feel relief. Not so we could just feel good. So we would be what he called us to be. Take your story and share it with others. You'll never know what truly you can do for others until you become honest enough to say, hey, sometimes life stinks. But here's what God did. I remember being so broke, I couldn't pay my bills. But here's what God did. I remember being so alone and so far from God. And here's what God did. You know what those stories mean to people that are in the same place? Well, I ain't got no story. You better get one. You better get right with God today. You better ask him to come into your heart and forgive you of your sins. You need to transfer your title and not be so in control. Wow. Pastor, I got to have a hand on things. That's what's wrong with you. What happened if God's hand was on you? You know how much fun it is to live for God? When you're truly following him and he's opening doors, no man can shut. And you go, how did that happen? I don't care. Thank you, God. I want you living like that. But you got to surrender. Emma, you got a song today? Come sing it. Praise team, come on. Now, folks, we're going to create an attitude prayer. And I need every one of you to look inside your own heart. Don't tell your neighbor how their heart looks because you have no clue. You think you do. You may have a little clue, but you really don't have a clue. But I need you to look in your heart and be honest with God. Are you living for God today? If you ask him to come in your heart, forgive you for sins. Because I'm a lot like Jesus. I don't want any of you to go to hell. I'm not willing for you to perish on my watch. I'm rooting for you. I want to take you to heaven. Or at least point you in the right direction. But I want to be your greatest cheerleader when he says, Enter in, thou good and faithful. I'm going to be up there screaming, God, look at you. Yeah. It's what this is all about. We're all in this together. Not here to look around, look down our noses, but to lift each other up. Say, come on, brother. Come on, sister.